All right, thank you so much. Um, I very much uh, appreciate and congratulate the Institute for organizing this, um, this meeting. Um, so uh, what I will talk to you um, about today, it doesn't have an algorithm, doesn't have machine learning, this will come later. But uh, I thought I should perhaps uh, give you um, a general view of how I see some of the fundamental problems in um, a very relatively new and very exciting area, which is the area of robot advising. And um, robot advising, of course, uh, is picking up uh, very fast, uh, and we have. Um, a new area from the quantitative, from the qualitative point of view. As you are going to see, in my view, there are fundamental problems we need to start thinking about, and hopefully I will have enough time to touch upon most of them. So um, robot advising from the, I would say, scientific point of view is a human machine interaction system. From the practical point of view, it has been um, applied recently relatively to wealth management, retirement choice, debt consolidation, and so on. And of course, um, we don't want to replace um, the human advisor altogether. Maybe one day this will happen, but for now, we want to start thinking about how to build the landscape of a human machine interaction uh, system. So in this talk, I will um, discuss uh, some of the conceptual and mod modeling challenges. I will present some results and map them to what I think is important. I will talk about new problems and a long list of uh, new directions. And in my talk, the general theme will be centered more on the important part of robot advising, which is the client, the, the individual, and how we think about understanding and serving, seeing this, uh, the individuals in, uh, in the robot advising platform. So um, the good news is that this is um, a relatively very, very open area. There is um, a short list of papers. I'm sure I'm skipping uh, a couple, but I don't think I'm skipping a lot because I don't think there are many papers in robot advising. So we do have um, uh, some literature on qualitative aspects, and I believe uh, Alberto will talk about some of these issues tomorrow. We also have um, quantitative papers that come more from the quantitative finance, mathematical finance, portfolio allocation um, uh, community. And um, um, we talk about, uh, in these models, the general theme is perhaps how to apply uh, machine learning to elicit preferences, how to think about uh, gen uh, different goals. But the general theme is more stochastic optimization within this um, human machine interaction system. So how do I start thinking about such a system? Well, forget uh, all the technicalities, all the, um, the needs for building algorithms and this, and they start the profundis, like how will I think about the client and the robot? So who is the client? The client is an entity that has uh, emotions, right? So it's, uh, it's already difficult to, to model this emotion. So we have risk aversion, risk tolerance, rational inattention, bounded rationality, you name it. But also the client has goals, targets, wishes, and so on. On the other hand, the robot does not have uh, feelings. Uh, it has computational power, and also it has access to market uh, opportunities. So we need to put these two entities together and therefore, we need to start thinking about a good communication, which is, in my view, one of the most difficult things to set up for good reasons that I will explain. Once we understand perhaps what the client wants, I can start thinking about um, portfolio construction. 
And then, of course, I need to start thinking about uh, performance evaluation. How do I say whether I'm pleased with my robo and so on? I would like to make a point at this point that I think that a lot of the attention I see in the, at least in the academic um, approach, is more on portfolio construction. So we do try to build very sophisticated models to capture asset returns, to throw many factors, to have um, a very rich part of the system. However, if we are going to pair these very sophisticated models with very naive models to model the client, then in my view, this is not a good way to go. So there is a lot of challenge in understanding and modeling the client. In my view, this is an area that, that lives in dark ages. So let's start thinking about some of the fundamental questions. So first of all, how do I model the client? So what, what is the issue that I need to model in order to say that I describe this client or this group of clients and so on. Then the question is, how do I quantify it? And so far, um, all of us are used to think about risk aversion, risk tolerance. Um, this is not enough because these are academic, if you like, um, and, uh, quantities that we know how to define, but they are static. And when time comes in, then problems become very complex. So keep that in mind for later on. Then the thing is that how does the machine elicit the preferences and the targets of the client now and as time goes? So the communication schedule, the communication in general is something that is um, extremely important in my mind. How do I evaluate the robo advisor is another issue that I don't think has been done. There are only just a couple papers that touch upon some static criteria, but don't address um, more general questions here. So let's start with um, a model that we built with um, uh, Caponi is fine on just a couple of years ago and has appeared in management science. So in that model, um, we were, I believe, the first who were able to come up with a stochastic model for risk preferences. And at this point, I would like to make um, a strong point. We have the misunderstanding in academia that if I have a multi-period model for asset returns, let's say a log normal market from zero to capital T, and I have a dynamic, so to a stochastic model for the assets, I have my Markovich or I have my expected utility at the end. This is a dynamic model. In terms of the market environment, indeed, this is a dynamic model. But if you look at it from the perspective of preferences, this is a static mode because you fix your uh, utility at the end of the horizon you or you fix your Markovich coefficient at the beginning for the end of the horizon and that's it. So when we talk about stochastic risk preferences, I refer to something way much more general than what we are used so far. So in this model, uh, in this paper, we were able to capture many realistic uh, features that we would like to have in robo-advising systems. And I'll come back to this in, in a minute. So what happens uh, from the client point of view? Not from the machine point of view, the client, me, the individual. So I start with an investment horizon, which can be long, short, um, random, um, uh, it's flexible. And at the beginning of the horizon, I put a goal. At this point, I would like you to um, just pay attention to the two indices I put, zero and capital T. So this is like a term structure of goals. I set a goal at some point for a future point. 
The same way when I think about expected utility problems, I start today and I put a utility for five years from now. I have no, I, I don't define my utility six years from now. I defined it five years from now and that's it. I solve the problem from zero to five. So in this framework, I still, I, I follow the same um, direction. I have a goal from zero to capital T. Think about as a term structure of goals. The goal can be an investment target. It can be a life goal. Uh, can be anything that I, I put today for capital T. However, as time moves and probably, surely, for a, a upcoming, upcoming random times, T1, T2, and so on, these goals will change. I don't know these goals now. This is a major deficiency of existing models. I cannot predict in general my goals as time goes. I don't know when I'm going to get sick, when I'm going to change jobs, when I'm going to have um, um, children or actually a grandchild that I recently had. And uh, that I don't know. So these are going to be times at which the goals are going to change. So we have a moving stochastic term structure as time goes. All right. So what happens now? The machine quantifies these goals given a communication schedule that we are going to talk about today. However, the first problem is that even though the machine knows that the client will be changing his or her goals as time goes, the machine cannot know these goals uh, perfectly. Therefore, there is going to be, through a communication schedule, a term structure of goals as seen from the machine. And these goals, in general, are going to be very different. Why? because not only the machine will not have perfect access to the random times at which the client changes her goals, but also the machine might not be able to decode and elicit the goals from the client point of view. So right from the beginning, from the moment you allow a rich landscape that goals evolve with time, and the machine needs to elicit them, you have possible discrepancies in terms of the times at which the goals will change and the communication will happen and the goals themselves and the decoding of the goals, okay? So now the machine is facing another family of risks. This is because the machine will also have to solve um, an asset allocation problem. So the machine right away faces market risk. Why? Because when the machine starts at, let's say zero, in order to solve the first dynamic problem with the first goal, the machine needs to know precisely, or at least a family of market models from zero to capital T. Now, the goals will be changing the elicitation of goals will be also changing, but the market will be changing. So you can see now that there is going to be, right from the beginning, there are going to be three different scales of changes in the problem going forward. And therefore, you can see right from the beginning that whatever the robo had promised at equals zero, which was the value function of the, um, of the original uh, problem is going to deviate considerably of what the client would, would wish later on. All right. So what is happening now is that the machine is facing risks. And the machine, as I said, the risks that the machine faces come from accurately assessing the changing market environment that has nothing to do with the goals of the investor as such, and accurately, accurately assessing what the client desires. So for those of you, I don't know if there are mathematicians in the audience, for those of you who work in um, uh, different scales, multi-scale stochastic homogenization, this is a paradise of problems. 
for uh, this kind of, um, you know, this kind of taste in stochastic optimization. All right, so how do I think about goals? So in general, a goal can be single or multiple. So this has to do with the type of goal. What is more difficult as you're going to see is that simultaneously I can have goals at different distinct times. This is an open problem. Um, the other problem is that it is very difficult to have a taxonomy and ordering of goals. Why is that? Because even if we think about the risk aversion and say I am more risk averse than something than, than my colleague, this is again a static way of assessing a risk. But when I have different goals at different times, it is not clear how do I uh, create a hierarchy of goals. This is a very interesting question. And in my view, some partial answers are out there, but they're not satisfactory uh, at all. The other thing is that goals move with performance and move with uncertainty. So I can have a goal now, but the goal might change very quickly in a non-predictable way. So when we talk about goals, we will be facing this long list of features that we have to worry about. So what is the most um, natural, I would say, way to think about goals, just because we are used to this in portfolio allocation, in my view, is through a mean variance. Now, at this point, I would like to stress again what I talked about a few minutes earlier. If you set up a Markovic problem, um, we need to be very careful about this very famous trade-off coefficient. The trade-off coefficient has two indices in it, when we choose it and for when we choose it. So most of the cases, we naively take it to be constant or de to depend on something that is, that is a very static dependence. But as time goes, this gamma that makes this problem so interesting will be changing. So keep that in mind. Even at equal zero, I have two issues. I might have one goal in my mind, but the machine might perceive my goal differently through a questionnaire, uh, through an interaction that I will have the machine. So I can say I have a perfect communication if in the context of mean variance, the trade-off coefficient that I put um, is the same for the client and is the same for the, uh, for the robot. However, right from the beginning, you can see the different scales. And whatever I have is, uh, with black means that does not change. So calendar time is fixed. I will take trading times to be fixed even though this changes as well. And you can see now that I will be having a model for the risk aversion of the client. Please observe the term structure of risk aversion with the two indices, capital T and zero, two, and so on. You, what I have here are the instances that the risk aversion of the client will be changing. Look at the third line with the blue letters where it says market. The, you can see the market models as they change, as we move along uh, forward in time. And also you can see the communication. Uh, in general, what the machine understands is different than what the, the client wants. You can see, for example, that at equal zero, the machine is in perfect, let's say, alignment with the client. The machine communicates again at equals one. The client has not changed his risk aversion. The machine misses it. Then the machine, for, for reasons we will uh, discuss, communicates again with the client at I minus one. Again, the machine misses uh, a change. The machine communicates again at I. Again, it misses a change. Then the client changes at I plus one. The machine misses it. So you can see right away that there are these different scales of random times in general that interlink 
the market, the client, and the machine. So sooner or later, I will be confronted with what is a good model for the risk aversion of the client, and what is a good model for communication, and what is a good model for uh, triggering for eliciting the, the preferences. Okay, so this is what basically we did in the paper with, um, the, with um, Agustin and Olson. So we built a stochastic model for the uh, risk aversion of the client. When I say risk aversion in the context of Markovich, I mean the trade of coefficient. Then um, this stochastic model triggers a stochastic model for the for the risk aversion perceived by the machine. And of course, uh, in the meantime, the machine needs to uh, keep track of the market risk misspecification, um, the market model misspecification risk. So um, for those of you who have worked with Markovich, um, I would like to say that this by itself was a new model because um, this is this was a model in which the Markovich coefficient itself was a stochastic process. And as far as I know, this problem has not been solved before. The model is very um, simple in terms of um, uh, asset returns. So I have a, a, a stock and a risk-free asset. I We took a regime, a Markov regime switching model. And then when you build your uh, the, the probability space in which you put the uncertainty for the market, you also need to put the uncertainty to accommodate the client. This might look as a technicality at this point, but then later on when you build your algorithm, this uh, comes in uh, very, very strongly. So in this model, we uh, assume that there is another sequence which we call epsilon n, that will characterize the, the changes, the individual changes that will come from the uh, client. So the filtration is the one that has the, uh, the factor model, the, 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 the Z process that affects the returns of the stock and the epsilon that characterizes the client. All right, so the standard, uh, very familiar framework in which I have uh, the wealth of the client, you can, also look at the return of the portfolio in terms of uh, state process. Um, so self-financing strategies and all that, this is extremely familiar to all of you. Let's not spend more time on this. And now I need to come up with a reasonable model for the client risk aversion process. So in this model, we, just, um, we, we looked at the model in which we had a multiplicative, if you like, uh, state process. The first component is deterministic. It's related to age-related um, uh, changes. The second component is um, idiosyncratic shocks that uh, have to do with how I perceive risk, uh, which is extremely bespoke. And the third, um, um, the third component was depending uh, explicitly on the uh, market sharp ratio. I don't want to spend time on why we chose it this or that, even though at the end we got very uh, natural results. I want more to uh, highlight the difficulties we faced on going you know, from A to B, from B to C, and so on. This, this is what I would like to, to do now. All right, so now I need to start thinking about the communication schedule. For this particular point, for this particular paper, we took the communication schedule to be deterministic. But what does it mean to have a deterministic schedule? It means that I have an F0, like set from the beginning, um, agreement, if you like, between the machine and the client, how often we are going to communicate. This was the simplest schedule we could choose. So I choose the frequency and um, I'm set. However, what is the frequency? The frequency is something that is up to me to choose. Why? Because when I am to evaluate the machine, the machine can come back to me and say, you chose this frequency, which was very large, and therefore I was not able to elicit changes from you. So by 
choosing a frequency, I become in some ways liable to the performance that I would expect from the machine. So phi in this uh, paper was an F0 uh, quantity. In general, phi could, could change with time, but for that case, it was constant, but think about it as an F0 measurable. So in this deterministic um, uh, communication schedule, now I have to answer the question, okay, I know that every two weeks, the machine will communicate with me. Yes, but the machine will, will pick up um, information from me. How the machine is going to decode me? One, um, uh, one uh, proposal we had here was that the machine is going to apply, if you like, a weight factor on my gamma C and the weight factor, which we call gamma ZN, is going to have, um, if you like, a path dependence of, uh, let's say, the return of the market. If I had, if the market was good, if the market was bad, this will change the way um, my trade-off coefficient changes. This was just one model. I'm not saying it was good or bad, but even to solve this problem in this uh, uh, stochastic trade of Markovich realm was not uh, easy at all. So I could have, for example, this gamma Z to be less than one if market outperforms and then bigger than one if it underperforms. So these are technicalities that you can build in your, in your model, but uh, sooner or later, you have to choose a way that the machine decodes the, decodes the client and creates its own client model, all right? So we need the communication schedule and we need uh, the elicitation of preferences uh, from the machine point of view. So now comes the personalization and personalization is, 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 is a very mathematical problem. Why? Because in this, um, uh, in this setup, there were two parameters. One was this uh, bias parameter, the beta that characterizes the different clients and the other was the phi that I chose which was the communication frequency. So in this particular model, personalization has to do with how sensitive I become when the market goes up or down. This is very personal. It's, 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 it's my over or under reaction. And the other is my willingness to be bothered by the machine. And this is the file that I chose at the beginning. So um, once I have that, Essentially, I have a good model. I have built a model for the robo. But you can see, even in this very simple setting, how many different things we had to put together in order to come up with something coherent. So the, the robo creates the filtration and also creates harvest the market information and also takes the information from the client and creates a model for the risk aversion. So where am I now? I had, the, I had the client's model, communication schedule, and the robo advisor's model for the client. So now the, the, the robo has um, a stochastic process, this uh, gamma R, that models the preferences uh, of the client. Has the, the robo missed a lot of information? Tons already, you can see it. And actually it's a very nice problem in Markov chain uh, theory to calculate some of the errors here. Nevertheless, let's keep going. So now the machine has to solve um, a very favorite uh, model, which is the uh, Markovich problem. But you can see here that the machine has to keep updating the coefficient that I have in black now. Why? Because by the time the machine starts solving a problem from N to capital T, uh, time goes, client changes um, uh, uh, preferences at different scale, machine communicates at different scale, and as time goes, this gamma has to be adapted. So this, is, uh, this was a very interesting um, problem from the algorithm point of view. And um, uh, if you have um, worked on that, uh, please uh, let me know.
Okay, so now we were able to come up with the optimal. Yeah, can I just can I just ask a quick question? Um, yeah. So, I, I understand how the 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 risk aversion structure is changing with time, and 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 how how you're building that in. But what I'm struggling with is, is the investor allowed to trade at those intermediate times, or are they only still allowed to trade once and then and then wait until the end of the time horizon? No, first of all, it's not the client who, who trades, it's the machine that trades. Okay. Yeah. But, but is the machine allowed to trade in the middle? <clears throat> of course, and that's part of the problem. So isn't it already very different from Markowitz just because of that? Um, you are absolutely right. So when I talk about Markowitz, I talk about the criterion that these are, that involves uh expectation and variance okay so in that sense um i refer to markovich and that's why uh i mentioned over and over that it's not a classical markovich in which you have a fixed horizon you put from the beginning a gamma and then you don't change your gamma you just keep going that's right. a static markovich even though i am in an environment where it turns change and I trade dynamically but okay, from the you. point of view of criteria exactly. now I get it yeah yeah Good. that's part of the problem here if you ask me what is the heart of the problem in in uh, personalized um, uh, portfolio construction is right this by the time you start uh, the machine tries to please the client the market uh, environment changes, the client changes, and so on. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Thank you very much. And that's why uh, I put, allow me to go back just for one second. And that's why I put this on the, uh, I put this slide. This is the heart of the difficulty, you see, because the calendar time the client time, the market time, the communication time, and the trading time are, ve are very, all these times are very different. Yes? Thank you, got it. Sure, okay, let's keep going. Um, all right, so here we are in this, uh, if you like, um, I don't want to use quadratic utility, it's totally wrong. Uh, I, this uh, time inconsistent problem, let's say. Okay, so um, we need to solve, the, the machine needs to solve this problem. This is the optimal allocation that um, we got. And once more, in this framework, we were able to incorporate anticipated changes of the client's wishes. Okay, now, how do I evaluate the communication between the advisor, the robo, and the client? We don't have a good answer to this. There are many ways to think about it. One way is to start thinking about the miscommunication metric. Is this directly related to um, bad performance? I don't know. We're talking about different things here, but perhaps one way to think about a miscommunication metric is to think about how much the machine misunderstood the client. That's one, one possibility, it's not everything, because maybe the performance of the machine was bad for many other reasons. But in this particular case, personalization was the frequency phi and my bias beta. So with this in mind, we were able to define a miscommunication metric. Um, on the average, like uh, it, it, it's a, it's a long-term average, if you like. And this gives you a metric that depends on how sensitive I am when market changes and how often I was willing to be bothered by the machine. And then you can run some um, optimization here to find what happens if I, I am willing to be bothered very often if I don't overreact and so on. So this was um, a model that captured many, many things. Mathematics was very difficult and the output was actually quite natural. So that's one possibility. So let's move beyond that and let's look at other alternative criteria and you will see 
how rich uh, you know the, the the landscape becomes with such with very little deviation of of what we have um, done so far so another possibility is to say i'm not going to have uh, a markovich you know in the in a way we discussed but let's say i would like to have a targeted wealth distribution and this was um, uh, inspired i did a lot of work on on uh, many years ago um, based on what William Sharp and Goldstein uh, proposed for desired wealth distributions at retirement. And a former student of mine, uh, Phil Monin, wrote his thesis on uh, targeted distribution. So this was a static uh, problem that Sharp uh, proposed um, 20 years ago. Um, people who are very close to retirement might want to have a specific targeted distribution at a given time. So what happens if I have this kind of criterion in a robo-advising system? That's the next question. So I have a market, just uh, let's move to a log normal market just to spice things up a bit. I have a fixed horizon. I have a log normal process and I have a targeted distribution at capital T. And I communicate this to the machine. There's no miscommunication problem here. So first of all, the machine will ask me, how much do you have today? Because it's not clear that I can construct any distribution I like in a specific market and for a specific horizon. And the question is, can I have a feasible distribution? Number one. Second question, which is an open problem, is what happens if I have one desired distribution three years from now? And then I would like 10 years from now to have another desired distribution. Can I do this? That's at least for a mathematician in, in, in quantitative finance, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very, very intriguing problem. Let's see what happens from the practical point of view. So how did we solve this problem? This, this is work in, pro in progress with um, a very gifted undergrad at UT, William Young. So what we did was we said, well, I'm going to map uh, the desired distribution to a terminal utility. This is not always possible. And it's not that I am obsessed with defining a utility. Actually, to me, a utility is the most, um, I would say, useless concept in this, in this construction. But it gives us a very good structure to answer many, many questions. So first of all, we, we thought, how can we map a desired distribution to a utility? Okay, can we do that? So based on some um, old work of mine with former students of mine, it turns out that if you are in a log normal market without going through technicalities, you can represent very explicitly the terminal wealth you are going to, uh, you can construct for a given initial condition. And for the mathematicians in, in the audience, this is, um, um, this is directly related to a representation through space-time harmonic functions and the market dynamics. So given a market and given my preferences, I have this terminal wealth. So if I have a desired random, a desired distribution at capital T, I can ask the inverse question. Can I extract the utility that is equivalent, if you like, to the distribution that I desire. Is this always possible? No. But for a large class of problems, I can extract the utility. And actually, in his thesis, Phil Monin provided a very nice characterization result. He proved that if I desire in a log normal market for a given horizon, a specific distribution F, I need to have initial wealth X zero that is given by this explicit formula. And also um, there is a way to come up with the policy that creates this distribution. So there were two things uh, determined at the same time. The endowment I need to have and also the utility that is equivalent to this distribution. Equivalent in the sense that if I solve the optimization problem with this value function V and I find the 
optimal policy for this portfolio, optimal portfolio problem, then we can prove that this optimal policy gives also the desired distribution of the client. So there is an if at only if, if you like, construction in this problem. That's fine. So now let's start with a very simple case. A simple case is what happens if I want to, uh, I, I fix a horizon, let's say 10 years from now I will retire and I want at capital T 10 years from now to generate a log normal distribution. And I specify the mean and the, the variance. So now the question is, can I always do this? What does it mean, can I do this? Do I have enough endowment to do that? The machine will say, well, if you want a log normal distribution, you need to have X zero endowment. Um, the machine also, when, he, when the machine looks at the market, my horizon and my wish M and K square, the machine can elicit my utility. Once the machine elicits the utility through the, the, mar the, the I function that is uh, the inverse marginal, doesn't matter, the machine solves um, an expected utility problem. From that utility problem, the machine picks up the optimal policy that will generate my desired distribution. So this is, if you like, an algorithm that um, the machine will, will um, apply in order to create the, the distribution that I like. But what happens if I don't have the initial endowment that is required to generate this distribution. Then I need to compromise. And the machine will tell me how much I'm willing to compromise. I should compromise, otherwise I will not get the distribution I like. So if the initial endowment differs from the required one that is needed in order to match the distribution explicitly, exactly, then of course I will uh, produce a different distribution. So now I need to modify my goal. This can be done automatically, like um, uh, it's very easy to write a program for this. So if I insist on having the same mean, then I need to compromise on the variance, right? Intuitively, if I have less endowment, I should expect perhaps to have higher variance. If I want, to preserve the variance, then I will compromise on the mean. So this is a very simple, um, even though the mathematics behind it was not simple at all, this is a very direct, a crystal clear program, if you like, that allows the machine to grant my wish uh, of a targeted distribution given the market and given the initial endowment that I have. Now comes the question, what happens if I have two goals? And um, this, is, um, uh, this is very intriguing because clearly you can see that in general, I am not able to uh, match both goals. I should not be able because unless the intermediate goal matches in a time consistent way, the problem, then I won't be able to truly match the two goals. So I need to prioritize the goals here. Sorry, just one, one other question. Isn't okay. it enough to be able to, to match or more than match both goals? What does it mean more? What does it well, mean more among distribution? Have a, have a distribution that, that is, has what more weight at higher levels? I don't know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So this is now a problem that is not clear. Um, if you tell me, if you give me a way to, um, to say this distribution is preferable, for me, distribution one is more preferable than distribution two at that particular time, still, this is an open problem. We don't know how to do it. It's not obvious. It's not obvious you can do it. Thanks. And you can see why. Take, for example, the case that um, we want to secure the longest goal. And you say, all right, let me make sure that at capital T, I have enough money to send my child to college 
And at capital T hat, where I want to buy a summer house or a, I don't know, a, 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 something else, perhaps I, I will miss that goal, that's fine. Um, the other is I want to secure the first goal and then maybe I go for the second, maybe I miss it, but maybe I match it in a way to be defined. So let's go for the first extreme case. You can see that in order to secure goal one, the theory will tell you that you need the initial endowment X zero capital T. This is fixed. If you don't have that, you cannot match the final goal. But if you start with X zero capital T, then you have only one random variable that you can generate. So you can see now that it is not clear if you prescribe a, a slippage distribution for the intermediate goal, as you referred to, that you said, well, perhaps I don't match the distribution, but maybe I can do something that I won't mind at all. It's not clear at all you are able to do it. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, I must admit, I, I don't quite. And I guess what yeah. I'm thinking is, what if I have two accounts and uh, I've got an, I've got an, I've got an, edge, right. Yeah. Yes. So that's a very interesting problem. Why is this an interesting problem? Because if you have two accounts, you need to specify the initial weight in each account. Because one can say, I start with an initial endowment and I split it. And I go with X1 for one goal, X2 for another goal. It's not clear you can do that. And it's not clear if you cannot do it, what is the optimal way to do it? No, but if I have, if X1 and X2 are both big enough to do what I need to do, then if I have more initial endowment than X1 plus X2, I should be able to that do both correct. things. If you have okay. more, that's fine. But in most right. cases, you don't have more. Right, I agree. But 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 at least I'm not completely missing what you're saying. What you're saying. Yes, yes. Happy with that. There is, a, there is um, a non-trivial interaction between market evolution, time, and preference evolution here. This is what, this is what causes all these uh, interesting questions. OK? All right. Uh, how much time do I have? Two minutes? No, you have about 10 minutes still. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Okay. I mean, that, that'll eat into questions a little. So let's say five minutes. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay, okay, okay. So I will, I will try to. All right. So another criterion that is um, that poses uh, more problems here is what happens if the criteria that I have are not related to distributions but are related to means. So if I have different, um, different expected values, conditional expected values at different times then how do I do this? Um, I have um, a preliminary results on this. If you would like to discuss this further, um, let me know. So um, now we have a general problem. How do I think about uh, processes of goals? And of course, when I think about a goal, I move away from the traditional uh, risk reward framework. And this is something that is the main idea in goal um, uh, setting investment. And of course, we don't know how to quantify preferences that we have. We had a very nice talk earlier this morning uh, for green investments, charitable contributions. What does it mean I prefer this over that? And how, what does it mean I prefer this over that? in uncertain env environments and also across times. So this is something that I think is worth um, uh, examining and um, you know, hopefully we can come up with, with good uh, models for this. So from the, um, uh, let's say technical um, point of view, I'm talking about uh, a hardcore uh, mathematical finance person here. What is that I, that I face? Basically, I will be facing a stochastic process, if I can say, of upcoming optimization problems. 
the optimization problems that I call, that I uh, represent here with script P, depend on the term structure of my preferences, the changes of the market, and I will be, and I will be, I will also have to understand how the communication happens. So ultimately, I will be uh, solving these kind of problems that are being generated at random upcoming times. So this is the general mathematical setting that I will have. Now, how do I how do I model the the client? Of course, the client is uh, a much more complex uh, entity. Okay, we we know by from from ourselves. Um, just having uh, even a terminal utility at specific times is not um, um, is not um, rich enough. Um, how do I, from the machine point of view, how do I deal with market model risk? Uh, this is a very different uh, direction that I don't have time to to go about. We can use adaptive control. We can use robust control. We can do filtering, but all these approaches have uh, deficiencies in terms of real-time model adjustment. Um, what is new from the mathematical point of view is the duration of every problem that comes up. The, pro the duration itself is going to be a stochastic process. So at the end of the day, what we get here is a stochastic control problem uh, that has a value function that solves the stochastic PD. This is a as mathematical as I can, you know, I, I don't want to go beyond that, but you can see how the stochasticity from both parts and the interaction and so on um, enter in this in this framework. Now, I just want to 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 uh, pro propose some possible behavioral characteristics we could put in these models. Um, so. We can have something that is popular in retirement, which is hyperbolic discounting. I think many of, many of you are familiar with the fact that discounting and intergenerational um, behavior is not time consistent. And this is actually very interesting when you deal with behavioral phenomena. Bounded rationality is everywhere. And it, in my view, it is very underdeveloped. You look at young people, they think about, rightly so, they think about their future plans, assuming uh, they are going to be healthy. Of course, they are going to be healthy. Of course, they, they have good jobs, but the uncertainty at capital T is not always correct. So these are bounded rationality problems. Of course, probability distortions, fears, right, left, and center, this is... Um, a very important problem where time consistency is violated. And in general, we need to start thinking about um, time inconsistency at large. From the academic point of view, we have examined this, um, but uh, how you make it practical is, is a big problem. So now I want to finish uh, thinking about uh, how do I build a communication schedule? So. A communication schedule, of course, is going to be a stochastic process, or if you like, a sequence of stopping times that will be triggered by all kinds of events. But sooner or later, I will have a model for upcoming stopping times. Measurability is an issue here. And then the question is, how do I choose a communication schedule? Um, I don't know who has worked on that. We worked on, on the deterministic schedule and this was already very complicated. If you have a, a random or even a stochastic schedule, you need to come up with a good miscommunication or a good regret uh, metric. But in order to come up with a good regret metric, you need to have a good criterion to regret upon. And it's not clear how you can create this. So one possibility is to come up with, optim with optimal stopping problems where you have the value function if you don't communicate, the value function if you communicate, but it's still, this is quite naive, even though it's already complex, 
because it does not capture the non-anticipated changes that the machine will face, the client will face, and also the market will, will face. So at this point, I think I should stop. I could talk and talk much longer about it, but I would like to say um, this. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this work. <laughs>